Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, could I just ask um, at the beginning, um, yeah, as Dr. Jaita was saying, if you, uh, if it's at all possible, please mute your sound and mute your videos unless we need to discuss later on. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be able to be part of this meeting um, across, yeah, all uh, physicians interested in HIV and uh, nursing staff as well. I'm um, sorry about that. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, as I was saying, it's a privilege to be part of this, to have a discussion with many people interested in HIV. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot today from our presenter, Dr. Gerica, uh, currently in the Department of Family Medicine with us. And um, I think we'll have good discussion following the presentation as well. Um, as Dr. Miller was mentioning previously, for us to get um, an idea of who has attended this meeting and for you to get your CPD points, uh, we please require to um, enter your details into the Google form. Uh, which has been uh, the link for which has been uh, placed into the chat um, and then uh, we can discuss that again throughout the meeting but i think um, yeah without further ado let's uh, pass across to dr herica and we appreciate you presenting for us very much today thank you very much Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Anya Herika. I'm currently a medical intern at the Department of Family Medicine at Cecilia Makiwane Hospital. Um, and today we're going to be looking at an HIV case study. Yeah. All right. We are still doing this. Sorry, just some technological problems. Right. So our patient is Mr. NB. He's a 29-year-old male. He's a casual worker in Manfani, East London. He lives with his mom, who's a 55-year-old domestic worker, and his grandmother, who's a 74-year-old pensioner. So he... Okay, so the patient presented to casualty on the 7th of May 2022. He came in as a self referral accompanied by his girlfriend. So he complained of a two month history of a productive cough, loss of weight, and loss of appetite. His vitals were all normal with a normal respiratory rate as well. So in casualty, bloods were taken for the patient for FBC, cusp, an HIV ELISA and a CRP. Sputum was also sent for gene expert. The patient was then discharged home and he was to come back in two days for review at CMH Ward 5. So when the patient got to Ward 5, he was informed that his HIV test was positive as well as that his sputum was also positive for TB. So at this point, the patient was very upset. Does no one explain that he would be tested for HIV um, and formal consent was never taken. So the doctor seeing him at Ward 5 explained that this isn't his fault, that the casualty officer didn't do his job properly and he's merely following up the results. So after discussion with the patient, the doctor started TB treatment and referred the patient to the HIV clinic for further management. So these were the patient's results from casualty. So white cell count but elevated, HIV a little bit low, um, HIV ELISA was positive, CRP elevated, normal creatinine and EGFR, and then his sputum gene expert was positive, rib sensitive. So the patient's script for pharmacy was just refer for sweet tabs and pyridoxine 25 daily. So the patient went to pharmacy to collect the treatment, but it was already closed. So he decided he's going to come back the next day. So how have we failed this patient and are we following the current guidelines? So the focus of today's presentation is going to be on the National HIV Testing Services, specifically looking at the policy of 2016. So the rationale of this policy is that patients undergo HIV testing uh, anchored in a human rights approach, which protects their human rights and pays due respect to ethical principles. And 
this is the document here, the policy So the goals and objectives of this policy is to timelessly identify patients with HIV, um, quality testing services for all patients, and linkage to appropriate treatment options. So in terms of the continuum of care, which is basically a goal to ensure that patients are not lost to follow-up, so we have the patients being linked to HIV testing services from the start, then pre-test pre information, which includes counselling, includes screening for other infections and diseases, then the HIV test that itself, post-test counselling, and from their linkage to um, services for treatment. So the foundation of the policy for HIV testing services is based on the five C's, which is consent, confidentiality, counseling, a correct diagnosis, and then connection to treatment. So consent or more specifically informed consent. So what is informed consent? So the patient should be given the relevant information about the HIV test. And based on that information, he has the right to either accept or refuse the HIV test. The consent should be and um, should be signed by either the client or a proxy appointed by the client, as well as the healthcare provider should also sign the consent. The three key components of consent is capacity, so the patient needs to be able to understand the information and to understand the consequences of their decision. Um, they should also be given correct information to be able to make a decision and um, voluntariness in terms of the patient has a right to refuse and their decision should be free of any influences. So what information should we give the patient? So we need to explain the benefits as well as implications of the patient knowing their status. We need to explain that at any stage of the process, the patient can withdraw their consent. Um, we need to explain the follow-up process, how the treatment works, care and support and prevention services, as well as the importance of disclosing the status to the partner, um, as well as partner and family testing. Then we also need to explain the HIV testing process and procedures itself. Then who may consent? So anyone who is 12 years or older and is deemed to be of sufficient maturity and mental capacity to understand the benefits, risks, and other implications of HIV testing. And anyone who is illiterate or unable to write can sign with their right thumbprint. Um, and if the patient is incapable, a proxy consent may be given. So if an adult is incapable of consenting, then according to the National Health Act, this is the process of which um, people are able to consent on the patient's behalf, starting with able to consent on the patient's behalf. Okay. All right, so as I was saying, this is the process of who is able to consent on the patient's behalf, starting with a proxy appointed by the patient, then a law or court order, followed by the patient's partner, parents, grandparents, an adult child, brother or sister, and lastly, the clinician or the clinical manager. So in terms of the Children's Act, um, there are four key points as to HIV testing services in children. So when can we test children for HIV? So when it's in the child's best interest and lawful consent is given, as we discussed before, then if the healthcare worker may have contacted HIV from the child's bodily fluids, such as in a finger prick injury, um, 
then who may give consent as we said if a child is older than 12 years or if the child is less than 12 years but deemed to be of sufficient maturity then they can consent as well and after that the parent or caregiver or the provincial head, head of the department of social development so counseling should include pre-test information to the patient as well as any um, assistant to the consent and then post-test counseling should be done as well and lastly no person may disclose a child's hiv status without consent again the consent being able to given by the same people as before then very important is a patient's right to refuse testing where the policy clearly states that there's no mandatory or there shall be no mandatory HIV testing and all testing shall remain voluntary with informed consent. The only exception is in cases of sexual assault where the survivor requests the status of the perpetrator um, and clients declining the HIV test should be offered access to the HIV testing services in the future and their decision to decline should be noted in their file. Then looking at confidentiality. So the National Health Act clearly states that no patient information can be given without the proper consent um, in writing. So this, the only exceptions are if a court order or law disclosure, or if non-disclosure represents a serious threat to public health. In terms of counseling, we have the pre-test counseling in which we should explain to the patient the benefits of why they should be testing, what the meaning of an HIV positive or an HIV negative diagnosis is, um, the services that are available should the patient test positive, which includes the ARVs and the follow-up clinics. Then the potential for incorrect results should also be clarified to the patient. Um, then prevention options and encouragement for partner testing, the confidentiality of the test results should be made apparent to the patient and the right to refuse to be tested. So in terms of post-test counseling, if a patient tests HIV negative, they should be informed of their results. They should be given health information with regards to preventative behavior. And the goal in this case is to keep the patient negative. Then if the patient tests HIV positive, um, we'll need extensive explanation of the results as well as counseling the availability of the ARVs, benefits, how and where to get the ARVs, um, prevention to the patient's partner, and then as well as counseling and testing for the partners or family. So um, included in the HIV testing services should be the HIV TB screening algorithm. And the, um, the goal with this is to increase TB case finding while doing the HIV testing services. So the algorithm goes as follows. The patient attends the HIV testing services. They're given their pre-test information, like we said before, they're given their informed consent. And at this stage, we screen them for TB, STIs, or any other non-communicable diseases. From here, it's followed by the HIV testing. If the patient tests HIV positive, then tests H uh, sorry, TB positive, we initiate TB treatment first, followed by ARVs later. If the patient does not have TB, we consider INH prophylaxis and provide post-test counseling to the patient. In the case that the patient tests negative, if the patient is TB positive, we initiate TB treatment there. And if the patient is, doesn't have TB, then we provide information and counseling. So in terms of the service delivery platforms, where the patients can test for HIV, where they can follow up. So we have health facilities and community sites. So health facilities would be any hospitals, clinics, mobile clinics. Community sites would be home-based visits, mobile clinics, um, in the workplace. And in each case, we have the provider-initiated counseling and testing, as well as the client-initiated counseling and testing. So in terms of the health facilities, where it's provided in, provider initiated, these would be, for an example, your ANC clinics, your outpatient clinics, STI TV family planning clinics. In terms of client initiated, these would be any walk-in patients to hospitals or clinics. In community sites, 
provider initiated is home-based testing um, or work-based testing. And client initiated testing, um, again, is standalone or mobile clinics or home-based where the client seeks the testing. Can someone with an apple? Problem is the arrow has gone. We went in. Okay. So home-based testing. This can be door-to-door -door testing where the clinicians, for an example, community healthcare workers go door-to-door -door, um, in the community. And this goal is to cover a large geographic location. The other form of home-based HIV testing services. This is the index patient model where healthcare workers would go to the home of a patient diagnosed with HIV and TB at the home screen partners, family members, including children for HIV and TB. Um, but in this case, the healthcare worker would have to carry all the necessary HIV testing service supplies with them as well as still adhere to the standards that are outlined in these guidelines. So the benefits of home-based testing um, is an increased acceptability of the HIV testing, as there's a reduction in stigma as well as discrimination. So people will be more keen to test, um, as well as disclosure and support on more a private setting, linkage to care and early identification. So the services offered um, include everything, as we said in the protocol before, which is education, counseling, screening for other diseases. Um, then we include family planning, as well as the HIV testing itself, um, and then linkage to ARV care after that. Considerations, however, when going to um, the home-based testing should be patients, cultures, religions, age, and gender. Um, any form of violence in the home or substance or sexual abuse. Then we have self-testing kits um, where there are two versions of the self-testing kits. There's the oral swab as well as the um, finger prick kit, which is the same as the ones we use in hospitals and clinics. But what's important is any person who tests positive in self-testing should report to a clinic or hospital um, so that the proper algorithm can be followed and they can be seen by a trained provider and counselor. Then just to note that HIV testing services in clinical trials or research, um, if anyone does test positive, they should be referred back to a treatment site um, to avoid misdiagnosis as well. Then we have certain priority populations, which I'll just run through the list but it's infants and children, adolescents and young women, pregnant women, um, couples and partners, then specifically men who are known to test late and st start ARVs at advanced stages, um, which leads to increased morbidity and mortality in men. In healthcare providers, in a setting injury on duty or needle prick injuries, then survivors of sexual assault, prisoners, um, any migrant and mobile populations, which includes truck drivers, farm workers, minors, then populations abusing alcohol and substances um, will be less likely to present to clinics and hospitals. Then specific key populations are men who have sex with men, sex workers, patients injecting drugs, and transgender patients. 
So in terms of making the correct diagnosis, we follow the um, protocol for HIV testing. So that can be either through the RAPID or through the ELISA. Um, so looking at the RAPID HIV screening test, you can either have an HIV reactive or an HIV non-reactive result. If non-reactive, the patient is reported as negative, um, and no further testing needs to be done at this stage. If the patient tests reactive, a confirmatory test needs to be done of a different brand. If the patient's reactive, it's reported as an HIV positive result. If the patient is non-reactive, we repeat the whole test algorithm from the top. So starting with the first and the second test again. So if um, the rapid, the second um, course of testing, if the rapid is positive, but the confirmatory is negative, then, oh, sorry, if the rapid and the confirmatory is negative, both tests are negative, then the patient is reported as negative. Um, on the far right, if the rapid is reactive and the confirmatory is reactive, then we report the patient as positive. Then we have the discrepant results in the middle, where if again, the patient has one reactive result, one non-reactive result, the patient is reported as HIV discrepant, and then we go to the reflex laboratory testing, which is the ELISA. Um, and in the case that a patient does test HIV negative, we should always schedule the next visit and determine this based on the patient's risk exposure. So looking at the rapid tests used, these are the ones we use. Um, and as I said, it needs to be two different brands of rapid. So if we look at the HIV testing, I'm sorry, the ELISA testing for HIV. If the ELISA is HIV non-reactive, again, the patient's reported as negative. If the ELISA is reactive, a confirmatory ELISA will be done by the lab. If this is reactive, the patient is then HIV positive. Non-reactive, again, is an HIV discrepant result, and the test will be repeated after six weeks. Again, if a patient does test negative, we should always schedule an X visit. Um, and in that case, we don't start with the ELISA, we start with the RAPID. So just to highlight some of the frequency of testing in specific populations, so pregnant women should be tested at each basic antenatal care visit, as well as at labor. Breastfeeding women should be every three months throughout breastfeeding. HIV babies, according to the PMPCP program, um, I'm not going to go through all of those. Then older children post breastfeeding up to 14 years should test once they stop breastfeeding. Um, if their mother is known to be HIV, if she's deceased, unavailable or unwilling to test. Um, continuing with patients between 15 to 25 years, if sexually active every six to 12 months or based on the exposure risk, they should test more frequently. Adults more than 25 years, uh, in this case, every 12 months, um, same as above, based on their frequency of exposure. Then we have adults exposed to HIV, for an example, in uh, the needle prick injury or other hospital related cases. So immediately, at assessment for post-exposure prophylaxis, the patient should be tested, then six weeks post-exposure for the window period, and three months post-exposure again. The key populations that we mentioned earlier should be tested every three months, depending on the exposure risk. Clients on pre-exposure prophylaxis should be tested at one month, and then every three months. Then, to look at the HIV laboratory ELISA testing versus the point of care testing, um, just to mention that the fourth generation of rapids that we have now are, um, have progressed to a stage where one of the main benefits is the decrease in the window period, where before we had to wait six weeks um, for the retesting, Whereas with the fourth generation rapid, we can actually retest after two weeks. Um, and then looking at the positive predictive values of the rapid test, the HIV prevalence in South Africa will look at the 10% column. So we look at the negative 
predictive value. So one non-reactive rapid test is 99.9% .9 accurate. A positive predictive value with just doing one rapid is 91.7% predictive. Um, which in this case, we are at risk of missing 8% of positive patients. So with doing the repeat rapid, if this test is also positive, we have a 99.9% .9 accuracy um, in diagnosing these patients. Right, then connecting patients to care. So the linkage is based on where the tests and where the patient tests positive. Within the same facility, Saying within the facility, um, if the patient is diagnosed in a facility that has, um, for an example, an HIV clinic or other um, ARV follow up facilities, then the patient should immediately be entered into the ARV register um, and followed up there. If the patient is tested in a community such as home based testing, mobile clinics, etc., that we discussed before. These patients should be referred to a facility to follow up and specifically a date should be set up for them to avoid the patients being lost to follow up. Linking between two facilities, um, same as before, the patient should be given a specific date um, to follow up there and then linkage from other refers to a facility. Um, for example, workplace testing, the patient should be referred with a standardized referral form, and again, a date should be given. So, looking back at our case of Mr. NB. So, the next day, Mr. NB arrived at the wellness clinic, and we identified the following problems. So, in terms of the HIV, the patient was not provided with proper counseling and testing, as per the guidelines in this policy. Uh, incomplete laboratory testing was done when CD4 and Hep B were not done for the patient. Then incomplete baseline screening in terms of STIs, mental health, specifically due to diagnosis or pre-existing mental, mental health conditions, any major chronic diseases that the patient has. A nutritional assessment should always be done. For an example, in Mr. Envy's case, he had a BMI of 17. Um, which would categorize him as underweight, and he would have to be followed up by a dietitian. Um, the WHO clinical staging should also be done, and in Mr. NB's case, seeing as he already had pulmonary TB, he would be staged at stage three. Then bactrim prophylaxis um, would be given if a patient's CD4 is less than 200, or if they have advanced stage um, disease, in Mr. MB's case, Mr. NB's case, we don't know his CD4 count, but we know because he's stage three, we already start back in prophylaxis. Then the problems identified with regards to the patient's TB diagnosis um, is the, the patient's case was never notified, um, as TB is a notifiable condition. The sputum was not collected for microscopy. Um, as the second specimen should be sent other than the gene expert. There was no education given to the patient with regards to contact tracing and screening. Side effects of the treatment weren't explained to the patient. Um, other collateral history wasn't taken, like chronic conditions, allergies, sexual activity, and status of the patient's partner. So what did we do on this day at Wellness Clinic? So we notified for TB. We started the patient's TB treatment. We did the outstanding blood tests, which were the CD4 and HEPI, as well as sent the second sputum um, specimen for microscopy. The patient was referred to the dietitian based on his underweight um, categorization, and he was also referred to the social worker for counseling. 
Um, the status was also disclosed to the partner after receiving consent from the patient. The patient was counseled on safe sexual practices to prevent further spread of the disease. The ARVs were deferred for two weeks at this point because the patient was unable to come sooner to the clinic based on um, economical reasons. Um, so for this reason, we took the patient's phone number and would telephonically contact them if there were any abnormal results so that he would come back sooner than the two weeks as scheduled. The patient was also started on Bactrim prophylaxis. We have given education on all the treatment side effects, including um, the TB treatment and in future the ARVs. The patient was also, uh, he received adherence counseling and the WHO staging was done. So when the patient came back for follow-up in two weeks time, um, he reported no side effects. He reported that his TB symptoms had improved and his vital signs were all normal. So at this stage, we checked his um, outstanding blood results. His sputum microscopy was positive. His CD4 was 37 and his reflex clad test was negative. Um, he also tested negative for hepatitis B. So the plan at this stage um, was to continue the TB treatment and to keep adjusting it according to the patient's weight. The plan was also to do a repeat sputum at seven weeks for microscopy, but this could be done at the local clinic. Um, the patient was also started on ARVs at this visit. Um, and so in terms of deciding the regimen, the patient has the, um, the patient's able to give informed consent based on which regimen he would like to take. So looking at the uh, benefits and risks of efavirenz versus solitegravir, which is explained to the patient after which they can um, give informed consent. So the benefits of using dolitegravir is that it provides more rapid viral, viral suppression. It has a higher genetic barrier to resistance, doesn't interact with hormonal contraceptives, and the side effects are mild. However, the risk of dolitegravir is that it inter interacts with rifampicin. Um, so the benefits of infavirenz would then be that it doesn't significantly interact with the TB treatment, but it has a low barrier for resistance, it interacts with contraceptives, as well as neuropsychiatric side effects. So furthermore, our plan for the patient at this stage was to continue the TB treatment and adjust the weight. Sorry, these ones, like I mentioned before. So the patient ended up choosing the dolitegravir containing regimen um, as he didn't mind the extra pull burden of doubling the dolitegravir dose. Um, this dose would also be doubled until two weeks after the patient finishes his TB treatment. Furthermore, the plan was to follow up with the dietitian and the social worker, um, ongoing adherence counseling at each visit, education about the ARV side effects that he would be starting on this day. Um, and in terms of future bloods, the patient's renal function would be repeated in three months, viral load repeated in six months, and CD4 repeated in 12 months. The patient was scheduled to come back in six weeks so that we could follow up his um, sputum microscopy as well as continue his TV and ARV treatment at this stage. Then the patient was to continue back to him until the CD4 count was above 200 and disclosure to the patient's partner was done after the patient gave informed consent. So in summary, um, of the HIV testing services, specifically these guidelines um, that are outlined in the 2016 policy. So HIV testing services is uh, effective in decreasing the impact of the HIV epidemic in our country, or more this is the goal with the HIV testing service guidelines. Uh, all forms of HIV testing, however, should adhere to the five Cs that we mentioned before, based on the patient's human rights. Early identification of infection and the empowering individuals is also a benefit of these guidelines, and this benefits both the patient's health as well as the public health. Early treatment of the infected persons can also be initiated, and this reduces the risk of transmitting HIV to other people. 
And then all patients living with HIV should be screened for active TB. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerica. Um, I just want to quickly take the opportunity to um, firstly say, yeah, thank you very much again. A review of policy is always important and it's good to reflect on our own practices. Um, just from a tech point of view and uh, administrative point of view, uh, if you look in the chat, we just need to ensure that um, for the attendance register that that is filled out and also to ensure that you get your CPD points. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Denis, who's just got some further information for us. Yes. Um, good morning. Um, just to put a few issues around the clinical governance around the way we care for patients with HIV. One of the key quality improvement assessment that have been conducted in Cecilia Makiwani Hospital, which I, we found uh, very useful and can be translated or you know generalized to the entire Eastern Cape, is how much cost are we spending on these investigations, especially when we have failed to act on the results of investigations. Um, in terms of the HIV diagnosis itself, we need to be familiar with age-appropriate testing. Vis-a-vis, -vis, as I will show in the next slide, the cost of these investigations. From the case that was discussed uh, just now, we realized that the initial, the first uh, the frontline doctor actually went straight to uh, pull blood of patients for HIV ELISA. Mm -hmm. The implication of that is that the patient we have to wait for a few days to know the status of his, you know, to know his HIV status, which in itself creates anxiety for patients, especially when they are attending uh, uh, risks, you know, or the risk profile may be highly suggestive of a positive result. And that in itself, over and above the cost of him, you know, the test, which we we'll see. see. Uh, I think the data the, uh, the doctor showed was actually referring to the paper that looked at about 10,000, over 10,000 community survey that used the testing algorithm of South Africa. And they were able to show that um, rapid test is actually very useful. Um, very uh, reliably, very you know, very accurate. Of course, few concerns, especially in the window period, leading to false negative results, and also patients who perhaps have been on ARVs and then they move from one facility to the other, pretend as if they've never been exposed to HIV. Those ones may equally give a false negative kind of result, you know. But I think for those who need more information, this paper is a must read actually. And that was what was provided in the, the, uh, the table that she showed. Okay. But let's just look at this testing, uh, the uh, diagnostic test algorithm itself. And we can simply just put the, the, the cost. How much does it cost the states to test an individual patient for HIV? 
from NHLS, looking at their 2021, 2022 price list that they shared with us and the management, for individual test negative, it will only cost the states 6.65 rand. So if you simply look at this column, uh, this uh, algorithm, using rapid tests by the bedside of the patient, you're able to immediately cancel and provide a proper result uh, to the patient, you will only have spend just six rand, 6.25, uh, 6.65 rand, just to test that patient. If you simply pull the blood of the patient and send to the laboratory, you will have costed the state. 62.01 rand. By implication, for every rapid test that turns out negative, you will have saved 55.36 uh, 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 rand of the uh, of the state's costs in terms of the amount we are wasting on each patient. So the implication of this is by simply following the policy, we will be saving the state's money. And by in, in addition to the benefit of the patient, you have immediately able to notify the patient, the patient leaves the facility without anxiety of waiting for a day, two days or a week to be notified of the result. And the chances of giving, uh, uh, of giving a proper result to the appropriate patient is equally you know, uh, uh, on point with point of care rapid test, which is that. Now, let's look at this scenario in which you need to do confirmatory test, in which case the first test is reactive, and then you go ahead and do rapid HIV confirmatory test. By implication, they are to cost 14.17 uh, rand. Again, you will still save 47, uh, 47 rand 84 cents by simply, you know, uh, following this testing algorithm. Now, there is a slight difference in the cost of the confirmatory test because of the high specificity of 100% in the second test. And that's why the price is a little bit different. But by and large, we are still saving huge money. And it looks small, but when you look at the number of tests that you are issuing or performing in the, in the province, and of course, the entire country, in which you are aiming to test about close to 8 million people who are possibly living with HIV, we will be saving a lot of money, okay? And of course, reflex uh, 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 laboratory testing should only be initiated after two rounds of two rounds of rapid test. In which case, you have a, a probable, uh, 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 you know, we have no reactive after the initial one. Then you simply go back and restart. So the chances that you need to pull a laboratory, uh, uh, pull blood for laboratory test, is actually very minimal if you simply follow the guide. And we are looking at putting a, a, a more like a gatekeeping system in order to prevent people from pulling blood and simply dropping in the lab for, for test. And of course for children, if you simply do not follow the guideline, HIV PCR is very, very expensive. Therefore, it's not a test you can just pull randomly on every patient because you can see the, the cost of diagnosing HIV in, in children less than uh, 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 two years. Okay. Now, in terms of the other investigations that we commonly will do, by simply doing HB alone in a patient, is 20 rand 26 cents. If you pull the entire full block out, you will have spent 65 rand. Again, you will have wasted 44.93 in a patient that do not have, you do not have a clinical indication for. Again, if you pull, instead of just requesting for each hepatitis B surface antigen, if you pull, if you mark uh, uh, hepatitis screen, full hepatitis screen, this is the minimum that could be spent. Again, you will have wasted 427 rand on that patient. Okay? Now, the rest of the other investigation, 
for simply patient without any clinical trigger. And you simply pull the blood for creatinine, EGFR, for a baseline for patient with HIV. You will have spent just 34 rand, 10 cents. But if you simply just mark urea, electrolyte, and creatinine, a patient without a clinical indication for that their test, you will have wasted extra 95 rand, 81 cents. So the, again, you look at the viral load. One of the key issues is that patients move from facility to facility and we pull viral load at every point without anybody looking at the, the, the uh, NHLS platform to look at the previous results that have been done on the patient. Each viral load that you do or order in a patient is 369 rand 54 cent. So you imagine patients who are even followed up at clinics or in the hospitals and they have repeat multiple runs of vi you know, viral loads done without anybody acting on those results, you will have waste, you each run, this is the amount that is wasted, okay? And of course, if you pull CD4, when there is no clear indication for it, you will have wasted two around four runs. So why is this important? The cost of care is expensive and judicious use of laboratory investigations by simply sticking to the guideline, you know, we will be saving more costs. And there is absolutely no evidence that we are actually compromising the care of patients if we only pull bloods that are relevant, you know, for the care of that patient based on the gu guideline that we, you know, we are sticking to. And that is the point of this stuff. Again, for every scenario where you simply deviate or you fail to follow the guideline, we are increasing mobility and mortality because often than not, these patients are delayed in terms of uh, getting definitive care for the condition for which the patients uh, are presented. And of course, the longer the delays, the more for the need for more expensive investigations because of all the opportunistic infections that would then creep in in that patient. So we hope that at least uh, some of this information will sink in because it's quite generalizable to the entire Eastern Cape and uh, clinics as well as every clinician involved in HIV care to make sure that we stick to the guideline and to stop wasting resources of the state. Thanks very much. I think it's time for questioning here. Let's open it for questions and comments. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Denis. Um, very, very important uh, uh, topic, especially now that we've got the NHLS um, issues. Uh, possibly something to think about would be with the new COVID point of care testing and the uh, provider initiated uploading to NHLS, we could consider that for the uh, for the voluntary counseling and testing, uh, because that would also prevent, even though it's a cheap test, repeat um, uh, testing, because some departments such as psychiatry want to see ELISA results on the NHLS system. So I think it would be much better if we could prove it on the NHLS platform. So I think at this stage, we'd like to, um, we'd like to open the floor for questioning. Um, I think the questions could be directed towards, um, towards anyone. Um, the case presentation was quite thorough um, and we really appreciated that, but possibly if there's any extra questions, we could um, open those up. Um, I note your hand, uh, Dr. Hera. Um, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to uh, mention anything. I thank you very much, um, Dr. Adene. Can you just put your slide up, uh, your presentation up on slide four? Um, just uh, one clarification part. Um, in terms of the confirmatory um, HIV testing, um, the cost is actually double. I mean, the, the positive results for <clears throat> when we send to to NHLS. Um, the second part, when the the ELISA turns out positive, the cost is actually a bit higher than the forty seven point eight four, because when you get a positive result in NHLS, they actually do a confirmation test, which also costs sixty two rand and zero one. So the actual savings in terms of uh, using 
uh, using rapid test rather than NHLS is actually 109.84, 85 rather. So it's going to be 109 rand for rather than 47.84. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, that's very important to note. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Nash, I note your hand. Um, thanks. Good morning, colleagues, and thanks for a lovely presentation. Um, just two comments, uh, also around the blood test. I've noticed that lots of, well, quite a few clinics receive uh, letters from GPs, um, and the GPs ask for a whole battery of tests. And this will usually include, this is for HIV patients, also non-communicable uh, non diseases patients. And these will include a full EU and E, it will include an LFT. Um, and I just think we need, um, you know, this is, uh, we're thinking of trying to write a memo to this effect, just to say that we need to follow the guidelines um, at a clinic level. If you're at a clinic, you have a person walking in who's absolutely well. You don't need a sodium, a potassium, a chloride. Um, you need to follow the guidelines in APC. So if they're diabetic, you can do an HbA1c, a creatinine, a potassium. Um, I think we need to be careful of just doing battery of tests and everything. And then I've noticed that when you refer a patient from a district hospital to a regional tertiary hospital, they, they usually want absolutely every, every blood under the sun. Um, and what I found when you check on track, track lab is that even though you asked to do those bloods, they usually get repeated in the regional tertiary hospital literally on the day that the patient comes back again. And I think we need to start addressing that as well, because if we've been asked to do a blood test um, before we refer a patient, it seems as if the, um, the tertiary and the regional hospitals almost don't trust um, the result coming from the, the district. Um, it's the same lab and obviously, you know, repeating an HP, maybe if someone's anemic or repeating, um, you know, creatinine or something. But I just think we also need to start being a lot more um, prudent in how we manage patients um, between sites and look at the, the results that have been taken. But you'll find that the whole battery of tests are, are taken again. Um, and, and I think this is also adding to the cost. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, your your point is actually uh, very valid, and I'm sure I'm not sure if Dave is part of this session, but uh, as a hospital, uh, this is one part of the aspects that the management is looking at currently, and we are going to actually, you know, we are essentially pulling all the investigations that are done uh, on monthly basis to begin to, you know, interrogate the need for some of those investigations, and they are disaggregated department so that we know where are these investigations coming from and your point in terms of uh, a doctor requesting a whole lot of investigations that may not be useful for patients just because of uh, as a way of uh, deterrence to get uh, accepting the patient where it's part of the attitude that needs to be dealt with even at the level of regional and tertiary hospital thanks And Mbonisa, your hand is noted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Tembisile Mbonisa from Star Apartment. Uh, I first want to thank Doc for the beautiful presentation. Um, wow, especially the part where it specifically informs us about the cost that we cause the state with wrong tests that we perform, not wrong, but inappropriate. What I want to comment on, on the first presentation is about the test and the written consent. Uh, Doc, when presenting, you said we need written consent for all the Test that you are going, all the HIV tests that you are going to do. But I just want to, to clarify and say the two, um, how do I put it? PICT and CICT, they don't both require written consent. Provider initiated counseling and testing. It only allows the client to give verbal consent and then the clinician needs to document it as proof. 
but for clients initiated counseling and testing, we need a written consent. We questioned this a lot as trainers to say, why when a person comes voluntarily, then we need a written consent, but for provider initiated and counseling, we don't need a written consent. It was clarified that for provider initiated, it is part of your diagnosis. For you to come up with clinical diagnosis, you need to do certain tests and other things. Hence, it does not necessarily. Yes, we don't say people should not get a written consent, but it is not a must. We specify that for people because some of our clients, they know these things, they might hear it the clinicians when they force them to write, to, to sign a written consent. Um, going further more, I also want to, I think this one I will take it to Dr. Zaka just to do a follow up for us and uh, advise us. Uh, when Mrs. Taylor was still in the province, she said as the Eastern Cape we're not allowed to do home testing. Yes, the national office has approved it and the guidelines are there, but as they is in table, they are still looking into safety measures for our CHWs when they go and do home testing. Only community testing is allowed, but home testing is not. Now, my, my, my main concern is that some of us have got partners that are supporting them, and those partners, they practice home testing. As a result, in Sarapatman, we don't have a partner, so we don't do home testing. But if you go to Nelson Mandela, because they have got partners, the partners do home testing, which then influences the DOH, CHWs, to also do home testing. So I would love Dr. Jagata to make a follow up with the HIV directorate so that we practice something um, that is that covers the whole uh, province. And then lastly, I also wish to 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 to, to make a follow up on self-screening. Um, Self-screening, when it was presented by the people from the national office, they never demonstrated the blood testing part of it. So we are requesting as trainers a follow-up training so that we can be able to assist the clinicians and the care workers on the ground to make sure that they do the right thing. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry for being so long. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for thanks for your clarification on the provider initiated counseling and testing. And I think the message is very clear that you know, irrespective of whether the patient has actually signed or not, as long as verbal consent has been issued, the doctor or the clinician must document in the file of the patient that the consent was actually expressly provided for the testing. And the, the, the scenario in with the case in, that was discussed here was that the patient had no clue that the blood that were pulled were equally included HIV. And I think it was important that that uh, consent will clarify that aspect. But thanks, your point is noted, and I'm sure everybody has learned one or two things from that. But I think over to Dr. Jakta in terms of the comments around the uh, implementation of the policy across the Eastern Cape. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mboniso, for your comments. Uh, I will follow up on the home testing and the community testing and check, and also the self-screening de uh, demonstrations that you are asking for. I will, I will follow up and, and, and report back to you. However, I had my hand up as well. Uh, thank you to the presenter for such an analysis. Colleagues at Primary Health Care, this is a misdiagnosis from us. We missed so many things on this case, and this case ends up at tertiary. And uh, Doc, you are just counting the, the, the expenses 
of the laboratory. If we were to count the expenses on this patient being transported from whatever center to where you are, the bed utilization, the nurses that must take care of this patient, the cost colleagues are so much and it all just lies with us that there was no counseling, no testing for TB. I mean, the patient started on TB treatment at tertiary, uh, CD4 comes were not done, uh, STI, mental health, chronic and CDs, nutrition, clinical staging, prophylaxis, adherence, all these issues are on adult primary care APC. It is showing us daily colleagues that if we are not using APC at primary health care, we miss a lot of things. A patient ends up complicating and ends up at tertiary with more costs, which is something that is preventable. So we thank you, team, for the presentation and if not already done, we would love on the side to know the, 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 the facility that referred this patient so that we can also go back and do some mentoring on them. We are training a lot of nurses. I've been in this department for eight years now. We are training nurses every day. We are telling them this. They are not doing what they are supposed to do. So when we have an opportunity like a mismanaged case like this one, if you were to share such information with us so that we can follow up with mentors in each sub-district. I will refer this case to the mentor so that the mentor can visit the facility, update the facility team, check specifically on the person who was managing this case, why was this case mismanaged to this level, so that at least at some point we can improve our care and reduce unnecessary transfers to tertiary level. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Boss. Um, are there any comments uh, from any of the other member of the audience? I'm just scrolling through the chats to see if there are questions that have been uh, sent through. Okay, no more questions um, from our from our team here. I think this is a convenient point for us to to sign off. So thanks very much everybody for participating in this session, and uh, we hope to see you know share with you again next month. Thanks very much.